How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> it's so weird because it's not to the viewer. And I had to do it again, and it was a little. Okay, Emily's here. Emily, if you can ask to join um, and share screen, that will allow you to be on the screen if you can hear me. Be up the upper right hand corner. I wish they would have let us on more than five minutes ahead of time. I know. <laughs> I knew I had that last minute panic. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? Okay, let me see. This works better with my light too. Can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, great. I got different lights from every corner. Let me, I think I need to close my curtains. <laughs> There she is. Hey, Aura. Hello. Oh, my eyes hurt. I was saying now my eyes hurt because I've had all that light. Okay, yeah, that looks better. Although now it looks like I haven't brushed my hair. <laughs> okay. I always look that way. <laughs> I have a brush somewhere, but. <laughs> well, I had to change my shirt too because I was just, you know. Wearing just a t-shirt, just relaxing. And then I was like, oh, it's not my Metro Care shirt. I better change that out. <laughs> All righty. I wish we could change our background, but yeah, I, I know. I was looking, trying to see if I could put a different. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I have some good food bank ones, but for some reason, the light in my office always ends up like cutting off half my head and it just looks very strange. So I decided <laughs> to clear off my desk and put the plant on there. <laughs> I was like, let's move stuff over and just make That's it nice. Up. Although I did just realize you can now see all my curtain, I mean, my sheets and stuff. Oh my gosh. Ah, okay, that looks better. I'm at home, but not too homey. Here you go. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Let's see. Right, and we still only have five, so I'll give it a couple of minutes as people start uh, coming into the room. And then, um, as I mentioned before, I'll introduce everyone, and then we'll start off with Susie. I don't know how many folks are going to be uh, is that, the five, is that the five we see at the top? Or? Yes, ma'am. So it's uh, we have four, and then uh, it'll start to grow as people enter in. I think they're having issues, too, as I see them come in and jump out, come in and jump out. <laughs> Jessica, do you know how many were signed up for this session? Okay, sounds good. She said they didn't really use the sign up feature, so we'll see who. I, I wondered about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which isn't a problem. <laughs> I'm just wanna give folks another minute. And if it's just for you, Jessica, that's okay too. You can help <laughs> share the word. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And it is being recorded, so other folks will be able to to view after as well. So this is a, always a good time to, to share. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Joanne Ortiz. I am Community Engagement Coordinator at CAP Metro. And I'd like to introduce Ms. Susie Etterington, who is our Director of Demand Response. We also have Aura Chisholm, who is a Project Manager at CAP Metro. And the lovely and always beautiful Emily DeMaria with uh, Central Texas Food Bank 
Bank, who is the Chief Program Officer. So I want to go ahead and let uh, Susie start. She's going to give us a quick presentation on some of the activities we've been doing during COVID at Cap Metro. Hi, everybody. I'm Susie Edrington. I'm the Director of Demand Response Operations, as Joanne kindly introduced me. And I will be here today to talk to you about Cap Metro's journey to what's now over an 800,000 meal delivery program. See if I can share my screen. Okay. Joanne, can you help me out? <laughs> I see that it's not allowing us to do that now. We tested it yeah, just a second ago, Jessica, and now it's blocked out. Is there out, yeah. something we can do? Okay, she's going to check for it. <laughs> yeah, it suddenly just turned off, so. We may have to just talk about it instead. <laughs> She's messaging tech support at the moment. Uh, so, well, Susie, as we um, wait to hear from tech support, um, one of the questions or one of the things that you just said is how many meals we've delivered thus far. So from March to now, how many meals has that been? It's, it's over 800,000. I checked yesterday. I think we're like at 824,000. Um, or I could probably confirm that, but it's about 824,000 meals um, that we've transported. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So fantastic. We were listening earlier in the live session about um, food access to our homeless folks, and they had mentioned the food boxes that uh, the Central Texas Food Bank had uh, had created and utilizing those uh, staples to, to help everyone and to be to hear those numbers, not just to how many people still need food, but the fact that we were able to reach so many and continue to reach them because of your help uh, with, with Central Texas Food Bank's help, Emily. How has this affected y'all's numbers? We're doing a little Q&A early because, you know, might as well. <laughs> yeah, our numbers at the food bank, Joanne? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, just overall, um, we went, we've increased both the number of individuals we're serving as well as the amount of food we're serving by about 43, 44%. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm just saying Hello. I was going to share your presentation. So if you just, if everyone refreshes their browser and comes back in, you should be able to share your screen. All right. Or whoever's trying to share their presentation. Yep. It's working. Thank you so much. So we thank everyone who's just joined. We had some technical difficulties. We are, uh, everybody's logging back in and we'll, uh, We'll get started. Okay. Can you hear me, Joanne? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, I hear you, everybody. And huh. yeah, it looks like it does a lot of screen sharing now. Oh. And okay. so on on the meal count, actually, as of the twenty second, uh, Friday the twenty second, the count is eight hundred, um, eight thousand. 828656. Eight, so 828,656. And so as of this week, the number will be even greater. Joanne, can I ask you to yep. launch my, because mine's still great. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, there it is. And there we go. There we go. So, um, as I had said, I, I'll be talking about how Cat Metro's uh, our, our journey to what's now over the 800,000 meal delivery program. Next slide. So how did we have the capacity to, to accomplish this? 
Our ADA paratransit demand was on the rise, tracking at about a 4% increase over our previous year when the pandemic hit. And almost overnight, we saw a huge drop in ridership. And now we're, st we're pretty steady around a 50% ridership over pre-pandemic numbers. Although we changed our scheduling strategy along the way to limit capacity um, to individuals, basically one person per vehicle, and we're limiting shared rides for physical distancing purposes, we still have excess capacity that provided an opportunity to respond to the community needs in a variety of ways. And one of those being food delivery. Next slide. So we use this excess capacity to shift from transportation of people to goods to transporting goods to people. And the key is really partnerships. And I would give kudos out to Joanne's group because this is her, uh, this is her bailiwick. <laughs> and um, we have old partners and new partners that were the key. And I would say the takeaway here is that the time to invest in partnerships is not when a crisis strikes, it's well before. And so our two largest partners are Central Texas Food Bank and Good Apple. And Central Texas Food Bank is our long, is a long established partner that um, both Joanne and Emily can attest to and was the first to reach out early March. Central Texas Food Bank and HEB Grocery have well-tuned processes to mobilize in times of crisis and were the first to reach out. HEB Grocery donated initially 1.2 million to Central Texas Food Bank and targeted 150,000 for the purpose of working with Cap Metro to provide food relief to our most vulnerable customers, which were mainly our ADA paratransit customers to help these individuals stay at home to protect health and safety and not worry about basic food necessities. And these were help at home kits, um, which were made of shelf stable uh, food items. Good Apple, um, major partner also reached out in March and they had received a grant from the Austin Transportation Department to begin a stay home, stay healthy program to provide fresh food, local food produce and non-perishable items uh, for at-risk groups, older adults, and immunocompromised individuals. We also have other great partners along the way. Avance, which is a national nonprofit, primarily Texas, um, that serves hard to reach under-resourced families of young children. FarmShare um, was, we um, helped them in a time that their vehicles were um, no longer working and we filled that uh, gap there. And their, their mission is to grow and provide healthy local food to improve food access, teaching new farmers and preserve, preserving farmland. And it's the only program that I believe provides food to SNAP recipients, a supplemental nutritional assistance program. Any Baby Can is a partner that offers services for family health and stability Austin Public Housing, we delivered um, computers to households and community care, I think is one of our latest partners. Um, and Ora can talk about that later, uh, that we provided food for, pa for their patients with uh, limited mobility. Next slide. So I think transitioning to transporting goods to people was a natural transition for our demand response department as we already had established uh, scheduling expertise, technology, we had air conditioned vehicles and safety equipment, including PPE and other COVID-19 safety measures. Um, community engagement, which is Joanne's area, um, worked with old and new partners to find out what the community needs were and, and, um, and is, was instrumental in helping us to fill the gaps where we could um, to meet community needs. Our project manager, Ora Chisholm, who's on the call as well, um, manages multiple projects, one being the food delivery, and she set up interlocal agreements and conducted weekly meetings between our operations and, and our partners. And demand response, of course, is set up um, to use its technology and our expertise to book, route, schedule, dispatch, and track deliver, uh, deliveries efficiently and effectively. And then um, Cap Metro had established early on an employee volunteer program that I just am really proud of. 
uh, for multiple COVID-19 purposes, um, with one being uh, loading groceries. And then our service providers, MTNs, vehicle operators, really stepped up and took ownership of the program and really showed their, our vehicle operators had just really showed their heart to serve the community. And lastly, Cat Metro's dispatch team that works every day to ensure deliveries are covered, tracked, and, and monitored. Next slide. As far as resources used, um, we are providing food delivery service with existing vehicles. So um, anywhere from five to, I think we're up to 17 a day at our peak and, um, and with our existing vehicle operators, Metro Access operators. To date, we've transitioned over 11,000 service hours, what would normally be transporting um, people to delivering groceries, which is about 300 to 400 hours a week. And we use about 100 internal staff hours a week um, for the program, plus a multitude of volunteer hours. Next slide, last slide. So our delivery service over the months really reflects a combination of demand during the highest COVID-19 risk stage and the availability of grant and donation um, funding um, for the programs. Our initial funding from for Central Texas Food Bank and Good Apple Groceries, the biggest partners um, lasted really through the summer, um, and had uh, and they re-upped through other programs through donations. But Austin saw its first COVID surge, as you know, a bit after Memorial Day when Austin was at, and we hit our highest uh, risk stage four and five, and then we were back down at a three for I think September and October. And um, now, of course, everyone knows we're back up at a stage five. So our highest demand for food kits was during the summer with those highest risk stages. And then, um, and the challenge is, I think, is the donation and grant funding as time goes on that has impacted somewhat on the supply. And we're not seeing as much demand for, um, for kits. Um, dem Demand has not increased like it did during the summer months when we were at a, um, at the initial stage five, and which may reflect, you know, we were on more restrict more restrictions, if you remember, um, and grocery stores had limited hours as compared to now. So um, we are not seeing as much demand. Oh, we have one more slide, sorry. <laughs> So, of course, our main goal is to minimize COVID-19 exposure and provide uh, food access to the most vulnerable populations often hit hardest by food insecurity. But we also realized other benefits that are important to um, mention. We provided um, work for our operator staff um, and Cap Metro was committed to no furlough of operators. And we also you were able to utilize our reservation scheduling and eligibility staffing um, to maintain their productivity. And then uh, lastly, it really helped us to meet our service provider contract hour um, thresholds, which was important. And the last slide is just a thank you. And I look forward um, to our discussion. Thank you, Susie. Now let's go ahead and let me queue up our um, Central Texas Food Bank presentation with Emily. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Emily DeMaria. I'm the Chief Program Officer here at the Central Texas Food Bank, and I'm really excited to get to be here today with our partners from Cap Metro um, and share with you a little bit about our COVID response and where the partnership with Cap Metro fits into that. Um, nah, let's see. I have a I wanted to start by telling y'all a little bit about the food bank and I've got a map to show a little bit of our territory um, and our agencies, but I'll kind of run through that while you're um, pulling that up, Joanne. Okay. Um, so, you're giving me weird things now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, many of you may know uh, of already know a lot about the food bank, but our mission is to nourish hungry people and lead the community in the fight against hunger. Um, we serve a 21 county territory here in Central Texas, which is about 19,000 square miles. Um, and to do that, I have a nice visual that will, uh, oh, good. Uh, 
Thank you. That sort of shows you um, that territory of those 21 counties. And then we partner with a really large number of partners on a wide range of strategies to address food insecurity um, in our community. And obviously food distribution is a major component of our work. So our primary network of partners are called our partner agencies. And these are food pantries and meal sites across the 21 counties. You can see them represented there by the dots. Um, across the 21 counties and about 80% on average of the food that we distribute across Central Texas goes out through our partner agencies. So they're critically important partners of ours as well. And there are about 115 partner agencies that operate in Travis County, as you can see from that cluster there in the middle. Um, we also partner with a lot of other organizations on a host of strategies to address food insecurity um, from senior specific programs, children's meal programs, um, we assist families in applying for SNAP or food stamps. Um, we uh, provide nutrition education. Then we also work on a variety of public policy issues relating to food insecurity. And pre-COVID, on average, we were serving about 237,000 individuals per month and distributing about 4.3 million pounds of food. So we'll talk a little bit about how that has increased during, um, during COVID. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so, you know, like many organizations, um, once COVID came, we had to make a ton of changes. Um, how are we going to get more food to more people um, and people who didn't know anything about the food bank services or our network or how to access those, um, all while ensuring safe and, of course, socially distanced services. So from a program's perspective, three, we kind of focused on three key areas. One, we heavily shifted our focus to prioritize direct food distribution. And that involved our partner agency network. These are, you know, those 251 partners trying to figure out how to do exactly the same thing. So we had to provide them with training, technical assistance, resources, inventory, um, logistics, guidance on federal guidelines that were ever changing. Um, we transitioned our mobile pantries, uh, which are our direct pantries in the community, um, to a drive-through model from one that had been a, a client walk-up, client choice model to a primarily drive-through pre-boxed food model. And then we also, as you may have seen on the news, um, built some new large-scale uh, mass distributions where we could find you know, larger properties where we could really serve larger numbers of families all at the same time. We transitioned our children's meal programs from individual congregate meals to um, a bulk meal program that was more grab and go. Um, so that, that was a big shift for just focusing as much as we could on, on prioritizing direct food distribution. Secondly, we modified our programming in other areas. So we wanted to continue being able to provide families a connection to SNAP assistance. Um, we never closed. We continue to see clients um, in person in our facility, um, but we also now are able to serve folks online and via phone. And then our nutrition education, we've really had to explore transitioning all of those classes to virtual programming. But the third area is where CAP Metro comes in, and that's really, you know, we had to launch new programming. We had to build what we've called special partnerships to meet the increased need in the community, and those have been with both new and existing partners. Next slide, please. And I think this is just a, a photo for you of some of those mass distributions. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, the Help at Home Kits was our shared partnership or is our shared partnership with CAP Metro and HEB. Um, as uh, Joanna and Susie mentioned, these are longstanding partnerships that we've had that we were able to build on very quickly um, once COVID hit. Our partnership has focused on met, uh, clients of the Metro Access Program specifically. Um, Susie mentioned these have been shelf-stable emergency food boxes, and we've been going strong since March of 2020. Next slide, please. Um, and here's just wanted to kind of show you one of the major transitions we had to make was we, we didn't usually pre-box uh, the food, and so we had to partner beyond um, even the CAP Metro partnership to identify partners who could work with us to really assemble those boxes. And that's an example there. A lot of community churches and other organizations really stepped up and allowed us to do that very quickly to support partnerships like the CAP Metro partnership. Next slide. Um, so here are the stats um, for the Central Texas Food Bank related component of the larger um, effort by CAP Metro. So overall, we supported about almost 2,500 unique clients. 
um, with about 12,500 emergency food boxes. And, and that equates to about 284,000 meals over the course of um, March through, these are actually through the end of December. It was an average about six, of about 647 a month. Um, so definitely you can see that spike there, I'm sure co corresponds with some of, um, some of your stats as well. Next slide, please. So um, some of the keys to success, and Susie referenced these as well, you know, we were really able to build on existing strong partnerships. You know, there were certainly some examples during this time where I had to pick up the phone and cold call someone. That was not really the case with CapMetro because we knew they would know us and, and I had already partnered with us and we would be able to get something started very quickly. Um, we all brought unique strengths to the table and were able to leverage those through this partnership. Um, we were able to lever, leverage additional partnerships to support this partnership um, because of the connections and relationships we have at the community and the strong support of our volunteers and community members. Um, definitely um, staff energy and flexibility from all the organizations was critical. Ongoing, sometimes day-to-day -day communication, um, as well as overarching community support because um, as Kat Metro has mentioned, HEB, it was a strong supporter early on and helped us get this started. And then the community has really enabled us to continue that um, through their generous financial donations. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just, I know we're going to save a lot of time for questions, but just wanted to say looking ahead, you know, we know at the food bank, we know that the need for home delivery continues, right? It was always there. This isn't a new need. It was just um, a spotlight um, and highlight uh, here that we were able to see how profound that need was. Um, and we want to continue to meet that need. We want to leverage the learnings from this partnership to figure out how to continue um, either in this current format or in others, how to continue serving folks um, through a home delivery model. We also wanna leverage the learnings from our partner agencies because just as we created this special partnership with Cap Metro, we have our network of partner agencies who also had to do the same thing with organizations in their areas. And so we really wanna leverage all of those learnings to figure out how to continue to do this and to grow. And then always we wanna explore new strategies and partnership opportunities to make sure we're continuing to meet the needs of the community as, as COVID continues to, to present to us the challenges that it will, but also, you know, again, as things quote unquote, go back to normal, um, we don't expect that to happen anytime soon. And we end normal, there was still need there that we were not meeting. So we're excited about this partnership and really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with the community today. So thank you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And, you know, for our part, um, the collaboration piece, as I uh, mentioned earlier, being part of community engagement, it's been eye opening because so many groups were in need of assistance. So many groups didn't have a ride. So many households didn't have a car to, to go and pick up the food boxes. So to have those partnerships build and grow and to learn who out there was actually helping um, work with food insecurity and how we could um, somehow be a part of it was something that I didn't expect to happen as part of Cat Metro staff. And one of the great things that I get asked every time I'm presenting to someone new about our systems and what we've done during COVID has been, I didn't know Co uh, Cat Metro did that. And it's like, neither did I. <laughs> but one of the things about collaboration and one of the things about COVID is that we all have had to pivot. We have all had to uh, make changes. And one of the great things that uh, Susie mentioned in particular was our staffing. We wanted to make sure that staff was not furloughed, that everybody had a chance to utilize the resources that we had available, as well as our own staff being able to utilize the resources we have available. Um, with uh, the Central Texas Food Bank, you know, uh, it it still to this day astounds me at how great the need was and is, but how y'all managed to. Um, I'm trying to find the best word for it, but really is just supply that need. Volunteers came from everywhere to help with those bulk distributions and continue to. And it's been 
one of the most thrilling things to see in our community as how people are coming together and, and work together. Um, but we do have a couple of questions. I want to um, hit hit those. Uh, Joy, welcome. Uh, Joy Chevalier of uh, Cook's Nook. Um, did you guys, and this is for either of you, uh, end up specifically staffing, or, oh, I guess not, it's for Susie. I know her second one is for Anthony. <laughs> but did you uh, specifically staff routes or directly deliver for the programs? And I'll let Susie answer that. And then the second part of that question is if any other programs were constrained by the existing routes. So I'll go ahead and let you answer that one, Susie. So we had uh, capacity in our Metro Access service. Um, and so we dedicated we've been dedicating specific routes um, on different days depending on our partner needs um, when we can pick up the goods from their uh, locations and uh, when they had volunteers to actually help um, put together those kits and so and that's aura is on the line and she's been handling you know all the logistics of what day but within the uh, demand response area we um, have dedicated routes uh, for that but we do put that through our scheduling system and we have um, people in our reservations and eligibility department that input all of the um, individuals uh, names um, so there's there's kind of two pieces on our metro access side people would call in directly into our reservations department and we would schedule those uh, kits within our scheduling system if they were not metro access eligible um, people then we would get lists from different agencies and our eligibility department actually enters in every single one of those individuals um, and where that kit is going and we were able to that we put that into our scheduling system that's the way that we we're able to track our dispatchers know where um, the location of the vehicles are and what's been dropped and what hasn't uh, and so that's it uh, so we're util utilizing all our resources Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm going to piggyback the next question onto that with Miss um, Aura, our project manager. She has been, for those of y'all who ever get the chance to meet Aura, she is phenomenal <laughs> when it comes to organization. And that's actually the question I want to piggyback on is um, dealing with organizations that you don't normally uh, have to schedule and work around their needs and their time frames and then also coordinating with the routes and the staffing and whatnot how did you um how did you decipher when new projects were coming when new um uh, entities were needing assistance how did you decide who were going to be the folks that were going to be able to utilize our services the best so basically whenever we received information of someone wanting assistance we set up what we call a discovery call and basically with that, that allows us to assess the needs of, you know, how many folks they're going to be needing. And then we can get some information to bring to our operations team to see if we have the capacity to help them. And generally, you know, between just coordination with scheduling, maybe we would deliver on a certain day for a certain group of people. We have pretty much successfully been able to manage uh, helping most of the people who have reached out to us but it's just pretty much discovery. And then from that point, working with our operations team to best distribute the, the distribution of the uh, food orders according to our capacity. Fantastic, thank you. Um, this one also goes to either of you, uh, Susie or Aura. Are there plans to allow Metro Access customers assistance or vehicle space to pick up their own groceries? Uh, for example, for this person, they can only carry one bag in a wheelchair bus. So we do have limitations on uh, how many bags um, that a person is allowed to bring on the vehicle because um, we have limitations on how much assistance as well for, through our operators um, and spacing because norm in normal or pre-pandemic times, we're actually, uh, our scheduling system's trying to pack the vehicles <laughs> and be most productive. So we've had to trick our scheduling system to do the opposite, to spread those 
you know, we really want one person per vehicle unless they're from the same residence. And, and so on a daily basis, there's a lot of manual process to try to trick it to not do that. But um, in post pandemic um, times, we'll go back to that. It sh it'll be shared rides and we will be pa packing the vehicle. So we have to be, we have to be uh, careful with um, how many packages we carry normally. Um, it also is a, a tripping hazard. Many of our individuals that use Metro Access, um, uh, they they all have disabilities, and many of uh, people have mobility devices, and it, um, there can be tripping hazards. So we just have to we have to limit um, the number. Sounds good. My next question actually goes to you, Emily, with the surrounding area that y'all help assist. Um, it, it, you know, coming living in the city for as long as as we have, um, it is a little easier to access a lot of the resources that are out there. How are y'all handling the uh, smaller counties around us? Um, uh, you mentioned in the map how you know, we have a large number here in, in Travis, but what about the surrounding areas? How are y'all working with them? Sure. So. Um... You know, we have a, a couple strategies. One is to leverage that network of the 251 partner agencies, 115 of which are in Travis, but the rest are in the surrounding counties and really work with them to support their home delivery um, models, which vary um, agency to agency. Um, we also run our mobile food distributions across all 21 counties. Um, now, those are not home delivery. Um, we do have an authorized representative or proxy process, um, but COVID has made that a little more complicated. And so we're trying to take a look at how we can streamline that as well. So again, for us, the, the home delivery, our, our goal is to figure out how to have a whole network related to home delivery that isn't just the food bank and, and partners like Cap Metro, but really leverages the capacity um, of those 251 partners to try to reach the greater needs of the Central Texas region, because to your point, not not all of our communities and most of them are not, you know, in Travis or have the same resources. So um, always open to new ideas, but really trying to learn from the various models that our partners currently have in place, as well as, again, the Cap Metro partnership, looking at things like the good Apple relationships that they've built and just figuring out what, you know, what that can look like for, for us. Oh, fantastic. Um, Susie, this one goes to you as well. Were there options with carts for the rural access of the shelf-stable boxes that were created? Um, we, not, uh, we, did, we did not partner with carts on, on this project. Um, that's prob probably something interesting to look, look at in the future. To be able to go outside because we we did keep it within the metro service area um and so i i think that that would be interesting to explore in the future sounds good and we have another question regarding our drivers is there a mechanism for proxy drivers that would be able to help out in um in uh, in these ways that uh, as, as needed, and especially with COVID um, being um, in stage five currently in Austin. That would be like a volunteer driver, mm -hmm. taxi driver. Um, so currently we would not, we would not do that. I don't believe, um, maybe that's something to look at in the future too. Um, <laughs> we, used well one of the purposes of this was to help keep our operators um, busy and um, you know not have to furlough uh, because we we didn't have the uh, work for them really um, so that was a bit a, a purpose that was filled with this program um, and one of the purposes and the um, the other thing I would say is that the um, operators, we do flex them back into Metro access service during the peak time. So those vehicles are out there for a certain part delivering um, groceries, but then we'll, we flex them right back into Metro access as well. So um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't thought about more of a volunteer program. Other trans agencies do have mostly rural trans agencies have volunteer 
proxy driver programs. Um, and that's something that um, we haven't done. Thank you. Well, we do have a couple more minutes. So if anybody has any questions, please enter them in the chat. Um, I do have another um, for you, Emily. So part of the, the system that is handling um, the actual food intake, uh, I'm trying to trying to frame this just right because we, we talk about the shelf staple, but I know y'all also had fresh food and I know a lot of families need that as well to maintain a healthy, healthy lifestyle. How have y'all handled that difference in that transition during COVID? Yeah, that, that's been very challenging. And there's so much baked into that for everything from just how the inventory mix has shifted and the inventory sources have shifted to the new partnerships versus the existing partnerships and, and all of that. But um, essentially, we recognize that families still need, you know, a variety of, of grocery shelf stable and otherwise, and the importance of fresh produce as well. So, um, you know, our network is still able to distribute a wide variety of inventory based on what they're able to order here at the food bank. Our mobile distributions have become a little more challenging, um, but we have any one day is going to look a little different at the product that people are receiving. Um, we've gotten an increase in government commodities through different government programs. Um, so we'll have everything from dairy boxes to frozen um, protein boxes to our emergency shelf stable food boxes. Um, and it really, we've been, um, although we are procuring and, and purchasing some food, we're, we're also at the, um, have to factor in the mix of what's being donated. So, um, a long-winded way of saying we recognize it's still really important to provide that variety, um, but we do have some constraints given the current environment. Additionally, when we partner with new organizations to distribute food, whether to a home through a home delivery model or not, um, it depends on the source of the product as to sort of the, the guidelines and requirements that we have to make sure are in place with those partners. So, for example, that network of partner agencies um, we use that term and it means something very formal in food bank land um, because that means that those partners have gone through all of the um, oftentimes government requirements to handle that product appropriately. Um, whereas new partners, you know, you, there's this mix of like, do we kind of crash course new partners to be able to do all those things, some of which are very complicated, or do we avoid things like perishable or items that really do need to be stored at temp um, that can become much more complicated for some of these quick partnerships. Um, and so it's just really a balance of trying to make sure we're still getting a variety of product out to families, but through a variety of different mechanisms, each with their own um, constraints and opportunities. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. This next question is from Ms. Aura. So one of the things that, again, makes me so excited to be a part of Cap Metro is that we are one of the first agencies that in the, across the country that did something like this. If you had to give the top three how to get my organization to do something similar, ideas, thoughts, uh, go to uh, what would you say? You know, a lot of companies have a lot of red tape, but let's just say that red tape aside, uh, what are the top three things that you would recommend for any organization to try something like this? Well, I think the, the top one, as everybody has alluded to, is uh, having a strong partnership because that is what has helped us to be successful. You know, we had the vehicles and the other things, we had the products. So uh, being able to uh, forge a partnership with some uh, agencies in your area, that would be very helpful. And then also um, in terms of resources, you know, we, we used our drivers, you know, whether it's volunteer or what have you. I think that those are a couple of the, the things that are very critical to be able to operate a program of this magnitude. And, uh, and then the organization with your team and able to coordinate all of the different uh, requests for assistance. So uh, partnership with outside agencies, uh, assimilating the resources internally to be able to uh, work with the supply and demand of the orders, and uh, then having a team to help keep everything coordinated and handle any issues. I think those are three of the key things to make any uh, program like this be successful. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been phenomenal. Um, we do have a couple more minutes. Um, at four o'clock on the main stage, we'll have uh, Joy Chevalier, um, again, from the Cook's Nick, that will be giving her final statements. But within these last 
two, three minutes, I would love for each of y'all to say, um, get, give us in, in a sentence or two, um, what COVID has meant to you in your current role during this time period. Um, you know, the, the, there's so many things that we've been through in our, in our work, but this project in particular serves so much more outside of that. And I guess you can see where I'm going with my statement. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just, a, <laughs> it, it really brought, brought me closer to the community in ways that uh, I thought I was already close to. And now I feel even more in, entrenched in, in a good way and, and a part of, of, of the community even more than I ever have before. But um, what has it meant to each of you? Let's start with Susie. Well, I think, um, you know, what it's meant for me, long, uh, short term and long term, I've realized that um, having a group of people with that is community minded to work with and has a can do attitude and, and just gets it done um, is so important in being able to put these programs out. Um, we launched these programs within days <laughs> and <laughs> literally and we could not have done it with the staff here um, at cat metro just jumped in and, and we figured it out we had never done it before and we figured it out um i think also we're finding um we're looking at i think the community a little bit differently you know we're looking at where where are the food deserts where are the we even had a partnership with Austin Independent School District, and I would call them Wi-Fi deserts. You know, we had a program that served that with our vehicles having Wi-Fi. Um, so long term, I think what's maybe changed for us is just to really um, look hard at our our partners, like Joanne was just saying, and and look at what our how our community is made up of and where the needs are. Um, um, maybe not only just transportation needs, but look at the future um, partners on how we can just meet community needs as a whole. And Ms. Emily? Uh, I, I love that question. Um, you know, for me, the things that come to mind are um, the power of partnership, the power of teamwork. I definitely agree with Susie. It's like, just we just got to get it done. Let's do it. Um, let's figure it out. I mean, we... Uh, you know, certainly have a lot of experience in food distribution, but the sheer number of things we just had to figure out along with our partners has been massive and we're so appreciative. So gratitude and appreciation come to mind for, for our team here, for our partners and for our community. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is, you know, we talked earlier about, um, you know, home delivery. Those needs are, are, we're already there. They're not going away, right? Um, is that all, you know, all the issues that existed become bigger and, and, more front and center, but so do the strengths and opportunities in the community. And so, you know, figuring out how then to match those um, strengths and opportunities with, with those issues so that we can um, tackle things that we hadn't tackled before. I think it's just with all the challenge, there is some opportunity here. And so we're, again, we're just really grateful for the community support, for you all support and, and, our, and our network. So, Ms. Ora. So yes, I, I think I will echo somewhat of what Susie and Emily said, and then uh, beyond teamwork and partnerships and also uh, change management, <laughs> being able to pivot on the dime. <laughs> we had several programs of other things we were gonna roll out and because of COVID, you know, we really had to step up our game and change management <laughs> as well, so. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for being a part of this panel uh, with me. Um, I want to thank all of our guests who uh, stayed and listened. Um, we appreciate all of you in the community that have continued to help support programs like this and um, help establish some food security in this um, in this world. And the, the more we work together, the less insecurity there is out there. So um, I'm just so pleased and ecstatic um, that we were able to share this with all of you. So thank you. And we'll talk to everyone soon, I hope. Uh, definitely reach out. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you.